Frank was founded in the Alberta District of the Northwest Territories in 1901 at the base of Turtle Mountain. The community was named after one of its two founders, Henry Frank. Along with Samuel Gibo, they had created the Canadian American Coal and Coke Company. The town was to help support the coal mine at Turtle Mountain, which lie in the Crow's Nest Pass. By April of 1903, it had a population of over 600. Dominion Avenue, Frank's primary business street, mimicked the Old West with its wooden sidewalks, dirt road, hitching racks, and false front businesses. DJ McIntyre's Hall hosted concerts, theatricals, lodge meetings, dances, and religious services with a nice piano and stage. Marks and Buchanan's Crown Studios advertised, our photographs will always whisper, come again, farther down the street. The Palm and Frank Cafes offered 24-hour dining. Harry Matheson managed the Frank Sentinel from his little Dominion Avenue office. The first edition was published on October 12, 1901, although the editor's spelling and type had not improved over two years. Union Bank of Canada was on top of the roadway near the new CPR station. The bank distributed $125,000 in American silver dollars on mine paydays. J.H. Farmer, a cautious bank manager, was said to have kept four loaded revolvers in his apartment above the bank. Alex Leach's grocery and furniture store challenged Albert Mercantile Company store, and of course, there was a post office at the end of the street. Frank offered most modern conveniences despite its primitive aspect. F. Thompson and J.J. Murphy sold menswear, while A.V. Lang sold women's wear. Murphy's suits cost 11 to $20, and the owner said showing items was easy. H. Gibbiad's Wines, Brandies, and Whiskey store supplied Frank's drinking demands, while Knox Presbyterian Church Minister D.J. McPhail battled the devil's rum across the street. Watchmaker Alex Cameron issued marriage licenses. Physicians G.H. Malcolmson and Tom O'Hagan delivered babies, and J.S. Carter's Frank Dairy sold milk. Dr. W. Barrett Clayton treated teeth, S.J. Beebe's Union Laundry provided diapers, and K.M. Langdon insured Frank's citizens, T.B. Martin, a barrister, handled disputes. The Imperial Hotel had the greatest $2 a day house in Alberta, with steam heat, electric light, and plaster. You could visit the pub to become drunk, and the Frank, Union, and Miners were all additional hotels. However, the mountain cast its shadow on a community, and it was hiding a dark secret. Turtle Mountain was called by the Blackfoot and Kootenai people of the area, the mountain that moves. They refused to set up camp in the vicinity of the mountain because of this. The mountain received its name from an area rancher, Louis Garnet, who, because of the turtle-like shape of the mountain, gave it its name. There was an older layer of limestone that was folded on top of the softer materials like shale and sandstone. When they started digging for the coal in the mountain, strange things would happen. Miners reported bizarre movements. The coal would essentially mine itself, being forced loose by the motions of the mountain. The mountain would sway, timber braces cracking. There was always a hint of pending disaster. But nonetheless, the community grew, and the mining continued. Until the morning of April 29, 1903, when disaster struck. Throughout the history of Canada, certain events are always highlighted, and are well enshrined in our collective memory. Be it the War of 1812, the Battle of Vimy Ridge, the creation of Canada in 1867, or the 1972 Summit Series. However, there is so much more to our history, and the history of the land before Canada existed. We endeavor to tell those stories, looking at chapters of our history that may be regionally well-known, but not necessarily well-known nationwide. By no means am I a historian, but I am fascinated by the history of our country, and I want to tell as many of these stories as I can. And if I can pass along my passion for the history of Canada to at least one other person, it makes this endeavor all the worthwhile for me. Welcome to Canadian History with Stephen Wilson. Follow along our journey as we explore Canadian history with atlas.digitalhistory.ca. You can trace the locations on map and learn more about not just what happened, but where it happened. See images from the locations, read more about the history, and discover more about the history of Canada. Atlas.digitalhistory.ca The mine at Frank, as mentioned, was owned by the Canadian American Coal and Coke Company. It was founded by Samuel Giebel and Henry Frank in 1900. Giebel was originally from Canada, but had grown up in Ogdensburg, New York, before setting out west to make his name and fortune. He would start a mine in 1896 in Montana, and then partnered with Frank to start the mine in Canada. 
Frank was originally from Ohio and was a former mayor of Butte, Montana. He would spend little time in Canada despite being the co-owner of the lucrative mine. He did pay $30,000 for the property. The mine at Frank was right along the Canadian Pacific Railway, which went through the Crow's Nest Pass. The pass was initially selected by the CPR due to the shorter route through Alberta and the abundance of coal to help fuel the steam engines. As well, most of the communities in Alberta were right along the CPR. Now, coal mining wasn't exactly an easy job. The miners themselves would often find themselves covered in dust and spent hours working underground. The dust that would cover their bodies would also be a cause of a number of issues, such as silicosis and black lung disease. It was dangerous work. Add in the concerns of the mountain that would move, rumble, and shake, and you could see why there were a number of concerns. The winter of 1902-1903 brought a lot more snow to the area than was normally seen, and then the month of April was unusually warm. This would mean a lot of meltwaters which ran into the fissures and cracks of the mountain, and then a cold snap. When water freezes, it expands, and there was a lot more water in the cracks of the mountain that moved. The night of April 28, 1903 was unusually cold, and the water froze. As the night went on, a crew that was working in the mine took a break for lunch, with three of them heading topside around four in the morning. Others remained in the mine during the break. In all, there were 17 people underground. The town itself was fast asleep. They were completely unaware of what was about to happen. A train was coming out of the mine in the early morning hours when the crew felt a rumble. Sensing something was wrong, the engineer went to full throttle, looking to get across the bridge over the Crow's Nest River. The rumble became a deafening roar as they sped across the bridge to safety. Then, the disaster happened. Around 30 million cubic meters of limestone, weighing more than 110 million tons, broke free from the mountain. It raced down the north side of the mountain at an estimated speed of 112 kilometers an hour, rushing towards the town of Frank. The slide would reach up the hills on the opposite side of the town site in just 100 seconds. J. William Kerr described the slide, quote, At 4.10 a.m. on April 29, 1903, a huge mass of limestone broke loose from the top of Turtle Mountain. It slid down the mountain, breaking into fragments that ranged in size from tiny chips to chunks the size of a house. The rock plowed through the bed of the Crow's Nest River, carrying both water and underlying sediment with it, crossed the valley, and hurled itself up the opposite slope to a height of 400 feet. The slide probably lasted less than 100 seconds, but it buried everything in its path." Unquote. The sound of the collapse heard as far away as Cochrane and Calgary, which lay over 200 kilometers to the north of Frank. The slide raced across the eastern edge of the town of Frank, with around 100 people directly in the path of the slide. It was focused between the CPR line and the river. Those in the homes were not the only ones who were in the path, though, as it is suspected around 50 transients who camped at the base of the mine looking for work were also in the path. The three miners who were outside of the mine would be killed during the collapse, with the 17 underground alive, but trapped. Carl Corneliansen would be awakened by the noise of the slide and lived around a quarter mile from the edge of it. He thought there was an explosion at the mine, looked out towards it from his door. He realized quickly, though, that there wasn't an explosion, but saw the rocks moving up the northern side of the valley. The sound also awoke Jim Warrington. He initially thought it was hail, then realized his house had been pushed 40 feet away from where it stood. His leg was broken, but he pushed through the pain to free himself and started to make his way towards children who were crying when rescuers came to his aid. Kerr told the story of one other person in his book, Frank Slide, quote, Young Lester Aykroyd, slept through the slide and woke to find himself under the floor of the house. He escaped through a small hole between the floor and the surface of the rocks. Lester was seriously injured by a splinter that pierced his abdomen, but was able to walk to safety. When the splinter was removed, some feathers came with it, having come from his feather quilt. His parents and his brother were all killed." Unquote. Word quickly went from Frank to surrounding communities that the town was wiped out by the collapse of Turtle Mountain. People speculated an earthquake, a volcano erupting, or even an explosion in the mine that was the cause of the collapse. Rescue efforts rushed to the town. They came from Fort McLeod, Cranbrook, and Calgary. The Premier of the Northwest Territories, Frederick Haltane, also rushed to the scene. The Chief Engineers from the Canadian Pacific Railway and the Geological Survey of Canada also headed to the scene to determine what had happened. 
work to try to rescue those trapped under the rubble began almost immediately, although the scale of the disaster would make it difficult. After all, there was 110 million tons of limestone over parts of the town. The night shift in the Canadian American Coal and Coke Company mine in Turtle Mountain was initially rumored to have 60 men in the mine at the time of the incident. But there was actually only 20 people who were inside. The crew in the mine had started work at midnight and were scattered throughout the mine itself in pairs or alone. Overnight, they worked on the tunnels and equipment for the larger crew that would work during the day, a maintenance shift, so to speak. The wall-like form of the coal seam ran from north to south. It was initially horizontal, but was tilted up to a near vertical position when the mountain developed millions of years ago. The miners worked to take as much coal as they could from the coal seam, where all of the mining activities took place. In order to keep it from collapsing, they first drove the main tunnel along the seam for almost a mile. Then, in order to keep the sidewalls from collapsing, they built slender chutes and manways upward through the coal. Above that, they mined the coal by removing it from the walls and roofs of huge rooms using picks and shovels. The fractured coal was kept in the chambers until it was needed, at which point it was forced into coal cars that were positioned below on the railway tracks in the main tunnel by means of chutes. The Frank Mine was located along the low slopes of Turtle Mountain's eastern foot. The main tunnel led southward from the mine entrance within the seam which was close to the river. The rock flow moved northeast after descending from Turtle Mountain's peak. The tunnel's surrounding sections collapsed under the weight of the water when it filled up the opening as it crossed over the mine. There was a strong tremor and a gust of air that knocked out the lights of the mine when the slide happened. Both men and horses were knocked off balance. The cause of the trembling was unknown, but they were prepared. The first thing they did was make a beeline for the mine shaft's surface exit. Kerr described the experiences of some of the miners, quote, Joe Chapman, the foreman, was working in a manway about a mile from the entrance. He became aware something was wrong when coal began to break loose, and he noted that it was 4 a.m. Becoming alarmed, he began to climb down a ladder to the main tunnel, when a sudden blast of air slammed him against the wall. Recovering, he raced along the tracks towards the entrance. Dan McKenzie was working in a raise about three quarters of a mile from the entry. The rush of wind and a shower of falling rock flung him against the wall, cutting his head. Ignoring the wound, he rushed down to the main tunnel and ran along it toward the entrance. Alex Grant and his partner were checking trackage when they felt the shock. They thought it was a gas explosion and instinctively headed for the entrance. As they followed, it heaved and twisted, and they were showered by falling coal. William Warrington was caught by collapsing rock. His friends helped dig him out before he was smothered, and he too made it to the entrance." Unquote. The 17 men who were in the mine all eventually reached the entrance and took a short rest, exhausted and breathless from the rush to the entrance. They put thought into their options on how to dig their way out. One was to just dig through the rubble at the entrance. They started to estimate how far they would need to dig, and they figured it was anywhere from 50 to 300 feet. Then they went to the lower tunnel that was used for air supply. They hoped this entrance would be open, but were met with water rushing in from the river that was dammed up from the slide itself. Another group went back to check one of the coal chambers to see if they could get out through an airway. The airways were all blocked by the slide, and the amount of coal gas accumulating in the area was getting close to lethal levels. Suddenly, one of the 17 remembered that there was a coal seam that outcropped a fair distance back from the main entrance of the mine. If they could dig up into the seam, they might be able to escape, and starting at 7 in the morning, three hours after the slide, they worked in groups of two and three to get out of the mine. We now go back to Kerr. Quote, As the afternoon dragged on, their oxygen supply diminished. Earlier, they had sung to sustain their courage, but now they were quiet, conserving their last bit of air and energy. At about 5 p.m., while the others slumped from exhaustion, three of them struggled on. Suddenly, Mackenzie's pick broke into the open, and he found the wonderful air and sunlight they sought. They were free. They had been trapped for 13 hours and had dug their way to freedom through 20 feet of coal and 9 feet of limestone boulders. Unquote. The miners emerged from the mine and were shocked by what they saw. The avalanche spread out like a giant's hand from the mountain's base. A group of guys were excavating in the area where the mine entrance had been, 
around 50 yards below the first man out. A rescue team had just discovered the passage and was only getting their shovels out. When the two groups finally met, they were able to share their news and express their delight at being able to find each other. But the mood changed as the miners discovered the fate of their loved ones and they started to experience a range of emotions. The miners would be given, though, a warm greeting as they were led into town. Within the town itself, tales of the Slide survivors and urban legends would circulate for years. Frankie Slide's tale is one such example. She was supposedly an 18-month-old infant who resided in one of the damaged homes and escaped injury. She has been said to have been discovered in a variety of locations, including, but not limited to, a rock, a bale of hay, her cot, a pile of trash, under the house's roof, and in her mother's arms. The infant was reportedly the only person in the route of the slide to survive, and because no one knew her real name, she became known as Frankie Slide. A song was created about her, and the tale was repeated and replayed so often that it became a legend. Marion Leach was really the baby's real name. Her family, of her parents and four brothers, were found dead in their house, having apparently passed away in their sleep. However, her two elder sisters were also sleeping in the house among the survivors. Thankfully, Marion was located. There were more than 500 survivors of those who were in Frank during the slide but managed to get out alive. Those who really survived were in the path of the avalanche, though. 23 additional people, primarily youngsters, were in the line of the landslide and survived in addition to Marion and the 17 miners. They lived in homes along the area's perimeter, where the rock avalanche was relatively thin and thereby spared their lives. There were many people who were accidentally present in Frank and perished, whereas others were accidentally missing and lived. Just to the east of town, John Thornley had a shoe repair shop. On April 30th, he expected his sister from Pincher Creek to return home via train. John randomly proposed they stay at the hotel in Frank as it was closer to the train station. She found it amusing, but agreed. Eh, that choice may have been the difference between life or death for them. A miner named William Warrington was the only one to make it out alive from his family. His wife and several children perished when their home was wiped out by the mudslide. Twelve workers were killed at a railway labor camp that was directly in the path of the slide. A crew of 128 was supposed to join them the day before the collapse, but they were spared since those men were in Morrissey, British Columbia, and weren't picked up by a train that was supposed to have picked them up when it went by. Lillian Clark operated the Frank boarding home and was the eldest of seven kids. She had worked all day and her bosses had convinced her to spend the night. Her parents and six siblings were killed by the slide. This happened on the first night that she ever spent away from home. It happened to be the night that spared her life. Twelve people were the only ones whose bodies were pulled from the slide. The Leach family alone accounted for six of them. Many of the victims were buried beneath the debris and only a small fraction of them were ever retrieved. Word went from Frank to Cranbrook, then to Calgary, and then to points east about the collapse of the mountain. The first reports were garbled and made things sound a lot worse than they were, if that were even possible. The initial reports were that there were a hundred bodies already found and 50 men were trapped in the mine thanks to a large explosion. The Canadian Pacific Railway sent a train from Cranbrook to evacuate the community. The federal government dispatched the Chief Inspector of Surveys for the Department of the Interior, while Inspector Davidson of the Northwest Mounted Police went from Pincher Creek to the scene. Another 10 officers were dispatched from Calgary, and they met up with a contingent of 25 men who were coming from Lethbridge and Fort McLeod. They would arrive in Frank at around 4 a.m. on April 30th. Also arriving with the police were reporters from across the country. The correspondent from the Calgary Herald, however, were turned out to be the source of much of the misinformation in the early days of the tragedy. Sending out reports from one of the hotels in Frank without getting any research done or even really talking to anyone. The following day, the Premier of the Northwest Territories arrived on the scene. Haltane met with town officials and a party of engineers was sent to the top of the mountain to determine if there was any more danger of further collapse. Crews also started working on clearing the river to prevent flooding. The work crew continued to grow until more than a thousand men were working to help build a road around the north edge of the slide. The group that had gone to the top of the mountain returned with disturbing news. They discovered more fissures at the top of Turtle Mountain, some as deep as 150 feet. They didn't feel there was the potential of another slide, though. 
another expert disagreed. A chief engineer for the CPR was convinced the top of the mountain was continuing to shift and expected more to come tumbling down onto the site. The Premier, upon hearing this, decided to evacuate Frank immediately. The injured were put aboard trains and taken to the police barracks west of the town. Frank became deserted and police established a perimeter to prevent looting while the town was empty. One of the few people who were allowed in was the editor of the Frank Sentinel. He would compliment the conduct of the citizens of Frank and added, quote, The arrival of the police is very timely as already vicious and cowardly elements, of which there are some in every community, had early taken to the bottle and drunken rowdies were strongly in evidence on our streets, unquote. Matheson also started work on the list of the casualties. He listed 76 people as having lost their lives in the slide, but that number isn't necessarily accurate. There were no records of how many men were in the construction camp, as those records now lay below the stone from the slide. Nervous eyes kept an eye on the top of Turtle Mountain for the days to come. The reports said there was a possibility of another slide. Then, on May 10th, the Premier returned to the town site. He met with the engineers, and they reported there was no movement. With this, Haltane said the residents of Frank were free to return home. Frank Anderson described the atmosphere in The Triumph and Tragedy in the Crow's Nest Past, quote, Despite this reassuring news, there was no stampede back to Frank. Merchants and hotel keepers reopened their businesses, but ten days later only two houses had been reoccupied. Since the mine was still closed, however, there was no great incentive for people to leave the assured safety of Blairmore. Even the hotels had few guests. On Sunday, May 24th, a large group of sightseers flocked from surrounding towns to view the damage. Their curiosity was interrupted when 100 pounds of dynamite being thawed by the railway builders exploded. A panicky crowd raced for shelter. Fortunately, no one was injured. On May 30th, workers at the mine reported they had made an opening to the old workings. As they explored the manways, they found, to their amazement, Charlie, one of the mine horses. He had survived both the cave-ins and days of starvation. The other horses, stabled near the mine entrance while the drivers had lunch, had both been killed. Charlie had survived by drinking seepage water, sucking his harness for salt, and gnawing wood from the coal cars and timbers. He was unable to survive the welcome of his rescuers, however, for shortly after, he succumbed to an overdose of brandy and oats." Unquote. After it was determined the mine was salvageable, Gibo announced that it would be reopened immediately. However, the mine was still ill-fated. In 1905, a pair of fires drove the miners out and seepage from the lake that had formed due to the rock slide made it difficult to work. After the passing of Henry Frank in 1908, the mine was sold. The Geological Society of Canada released their report into the slide in June of 1903. They noted that the miners themselves had reported movement well before the slide itself had even happened. The report said, quote, Mr. Chestnut, a miner, states that slight movements were noticeable during the last seven months. These were particularly liable to occur between one and three in the morning. He describes them as like the starting and shuddering of a ship struck by a wave. Mr. Chapman, the foreman, also stated that these shocks were most frequent between the hours of 1 and 3 in the morning. These tremors were somewhat alarming to the miners, and some are said to have left the mine on the account of them. It was also reported that lately the coal had been mined with unusual ease, often running itself, so that the miners were taken off contract work and put on to day work. Rock from the hanging wall is said to have been falling in and mixing with the coal, so that men had to be employed in picking it out when the cars were dumped. Cyrus Morris, formerly underground superintendent, stated that for the last seven months, there had been a general squeeze in the ground between 3,500 and 5,000 feet in the tunnel. The coal could be kept up only with difficulty. It was broken and would mine itself." Unquote. As for the cause, the Geological Society report attributed the weather. The night of the slide was extremely cold. Some said it was colder than any night during the preceding winter. 
The days before, though, the temperature had been very hot, so the water gathered in these fissures expanded when it froze, putting pressure on the already unstable mountain. The report concluded, quote, The rock slide cannot be considered, therefore, as due to a single cause, but rather, like so many phenomena in nature, to a combination of causes, cumulative in their effects. The chief of these were the structures and condition of the mountain, aided by exceptional atmospheric and other natural conditions, and also possibly by slight readjustments in the lower strata attendant on mining operations." Unquote. The report continued that the town may continue to exist for years to come, or could be wiped off the face of the earth at any time. The conditions that caused the first slide would continue to put pressures on the rest of the mountain. They recommended the town be moved a short distance up the valley to be outside the danger zone of the shadow of Turtle Mountain. In 1911, the federal government would appoint a commission to look at the mountain. They noted that the cracks were widening in some areas and recommended the part of Frank under the north peak of the mountain be moved to a safer location with the rest of the town that was past the CPR line. A new road would be built and new rail lines. In fact, that was some of the first things done so that the line through Crow's Nest Pass would remain open. Workmen who were widening the west end of the roadway in 1922 would uncover skeletons and parts of a cradle. These were determined to be the remains of the Clark family, and a memorial now marks the location. Then in 1949, work moving some of the rock to be used as ballast uncovered the original trackage of the CPR line, as well as a case of footwear, believed to have come from the Thornley store. Eventually, reminders of the slide would start to vanish. However, an interpretive center was built overlooking the slide, showing many of the artifacts that have been collected. It has more than 100,000 people come through each year to learn about the deadliest rock slide in Canadian history. In closing, the words of Anderson, quote, Today, the cascade of death that ruptured from Turtle Mountain still lies like an enormous scar across the valley of the Crow's Nest Pass. To tens of thousands of motorists who pause at the viewpoint each year, it is a reminder of 90 seconds of wind, rock, and dust. An awesome tombstone where lie at least 81 people.